as you probably guessed, the, t the title of my lecture somehow changed. So it's not sexual difference and ontology. I won't be speaking about sexual difference today. There will be some talk about ontology. And I will come especially in the last part to this little bit more political um, questions. So actually I was trying to think what would be the title of this paper and I came up with three titles. One could say, uh, one could use a kind of philosophically deep sounding title like limits of ontology. One could go for a more political title, political economy of truth. But one could also use the Freudian title, this is not my mother, which is also what I will be talking about. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm afraid I will repeat, come back and repeat many of the points that were made uh, by Mladen and also by Slavo yesterday already by Mladen today, so hopefully it won't be just repetition or repetition enough for it to produce uh, something more than just bare identity but I will really be coming back to many of the points that were already made uh, yesterday and today. Uh, and first I would like to start with a point that I left more or less vague yesterday, namely this Lacanian identification of the real with the impossible. For this, together with the fact that, as I also emphasized, for Lacan, the real is not some kind of a morsel of reality, some object that one takes, in, takes from reality, this might seem to suggest that the real is, isn't anything concrete for Lacan, which of course it's very far from being the case. And if it's true that the real is not for Lacan an object or something objective in the usual sense of the term, it is also true of course that we encounter it precisely in the object in the specific Lacanian sense of the term. That is the object that only enters in a correlation with a subject in fantasy, precisely. So today I will abort this more like the objective side of this parallax of decision of this split and so on. And I will first try to track this notion of the impossible a little bit from Freud and to show what was the, where also Lacan took it to begin with, although he made then something particular with it, precisely with this notion of this object. So in Freud, of course, the category of the impossible is related to the notion of the drive and of its paradoxical satisfaction. Uh, and if one were to sum up Freud's arguments concerning the sexual drive from the three essays of theory of sexuality, which already Mladen mentioned, in one sentence, of course, one could perhaps say human sexuality is a paradox-ridden deviation from a norm that doesn't exist. I mean, after enumerating all kinds of vicissitudes and strange paths of sexuality in the passage that I will, uh, of which I will quote just the concluding part, Freud compares a drunker, uh, alcoholic uh, to the sexual whatever drive and he says that uh, isn't it strange that uh, uh, a drunker doesn't need to go to the countries where alcohol is forbidden in order to fully enjoy his drink. He doesn't need to change his wine every day in order to be able to really fully uh, find the full excitement of the alcohol and so on, which of course is not true for sexuality. And then he gives this uh, point, which I think is uh, extremely important. He says, however strange it may sound, we must reckon with the possibility that something in the nature of the sexual drive itself is unfavorable to the realization of complete satisfaction. And I think so where, where and what is the impossibility in this very precise formulation? First, it is clearly not the impossibility in the sense of an external obstacle preventing the full satisfaction of the drive. And it is also not simply a kind of internal or psychological resistance in the sense that the drive wouldn't, for some obscure reason, want to be fully satisfied. Of course, we are not on the level of desire and its dialectics here, which would need some obstacles in order to sustain itself. 
It, we are on the level of the satisfaction and the paradoxes of satisfaction. So the paradox is far more interesting for it rather seems that the drive is both at the same time, always satisfied and unfavorable to the realization of complete satisfaction. And I think what is at stake here becomes very more clear and palpable if you relate it to the following uh, most, I think, concise description of the drive by, uh, by Zizek. I quote, uh, Doreen recites the difference between desire and drive. Desire is grounded in its constitutive lack, while drive circulates around the whole, a gap in the order of being. In other words, the circular movement of drive obeys the weird logic of the curved space in which the shortest distance between the two points is not a straight line, but a curve. Drive knows that the shortest way to attain its aim is to circulate around its goal object. And I think this is a very good way to precisely read or understand the quote uh, from Freud that I uh, read before, this impossibility uh, uh, unfavorable to the full satisfaction. Uh, what, it, what this means in relation to the impossible is something very precise. The impossible and what takes place are one and the same thing. The impossible is not an obstacle on account of which the drives decline from their supposed normal path or straight line, but this very curving of the space on account of which the deviation, the, the circling, uh, instead of the straight line or whatever the norm, is actually the shortest way. It is the shortest way to be satisfied. So, you know, this also was mentioned by Nada in the end. Freud insisted a lot that with the drives, the deviation, basically the deviation in respect to the sexual object which is supposed to be an adult person of the opposite sex and deviation in respect to the sexual aim, supposedly reproduction. So he insisted a lot that this deviation, fragmentation and dispersion are original and are not result of some subsequent turn to perversion. Drives are fragmented, aimless, partial, independent of their object to start with. Uh, just a brief quote from Freud, the sexual drive is the first in, in, in the first instance is independent of its object, nor is it its origin likely to be due to its object's attraction. So then this, whatever, normal, healthy human sexuality, so-called, is a paradoxical, later artificial naturalization, one could all, almost say, of the originally denaturalized drives, denaturalized precisely in the sense of the departing from the natural aims of self-preservation and or logic of pure need as unaffected by another supplementary satisfaction. And one could of course also say that human sexuality is sexual and not simply reproductive precisely insofar as the unification at stake, the tying of all drives into one single purpose never really works, but allows for different partial drives to continue this circular self-perpetrating activity. But I think it is extremely important to avoid here the idea that we first have a kind of chaotic heaven of freedom, creative and unrestrained by any norms and imperative, just these deviations, uh, and that these imperatives then come later, these norms to restrain, unify, this original explosive energy. In view precisely of the point that I um, emphasized uh, before, namely that here one should understand that deviation is the shortest path, is the norm, so to say, in a certain sense, this seeming original chaos actually turns out to be perfectly orderly or organized. It is very much organized by the impossible as its inherent uh, propelling force, so to say. So there is absolutely no, one could say, there is no freedom in the aberrating circling of the drives. The way they go is what they are. And perhaps this is why they also belong to the, to the real in some sense. 
of course, this could also be related to the question of clinamen and its declination as original, but I, I won't go into this. Uh, I would rather, I would like to relate now to some other absolutely crucial point related to this, which is uh, the, the question of the relationship between the real and being, so to say. And the point that uh, I would like to make is that the real is not a substance or being, but is precisely its limit. That is to say, the real is that which the ontology, and I think this is basically the Lacanian critics of ontology, the real is that which ontology has to cut off in order to be able to speak of being qua being, just being as such. We only arrive to being qua being by subtracting something from it. And this something, it's not simply some whatever part that resists, but precisely the whole. That what it lacks in order to be fully constituted to come to what Slav was saying. The zone of the real as the interval within being itself, on account of which no being is being for a being, but can only be by being something else than it, than it is for a being. And of course, one can ask, how can it matter if one cuts off something that isn't there to begin with? And that precisely, it matters very much, not only because when it is cut off in this way, it becomes something, but also since this something it becomes is the very object of psychoanalysis. I think this is precisely the core of Lacanian criticism of ontology, and I will return to this when equipped with some further arguments and examples that will hopefully make this sound less abstract. So in order to situate this a little bit in relation to my yesterday's discussion, we could say perhaps the curving of the space that constitutes the real has a cause and a consequence. Its cause is the emergence of a pure signifier and its consequence is the emergence of a new kind of object. Yet this is also to say that there is no such thing precisely as a pure signifier. Because the purer or the clearer it's cut, the more palpable and irreducible the object it produces. And this is, for example, the fundamental lesson precisely of the psychoanalytic notion of Verneinung of negation that I propose to take up now in some, in some detail, not very much in detail, but in some detail. So this, you know, this is a very short essay by Freud. It only has like four pages. Uh, very ambitious at the same time. Um, but in, in, in a way, for Neinung deals precisely, as also Mladen already mentioned, with a signifier par excellence, this no or negation, purest as you can get almost. And if, as Freud is reported to have said once, sometimes a pipe is just a pipe, and by the way, it is not insignificant that he said this in a discussion of oral fixation. I mean, he was give, giving a lecture on oral fixation and somebody asked about his own ever-present pipe. <coughs> Cigar. No, 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 this is a false quote, it was pipe, I just checked you it on have... Wikipedia or something. <laughs> no, but really, it's supposed to be a false quote, the cigar, and the, the original quote, but nevertheless, it was uh, in this source that I was, perhaps it's all, uh, not just another story, but that it was supposedly the, the pipe that they asked We got about. it, pipe and cigar to Le Vistros Young Village. No, well, uh, for me, the, <laughs> the beauty of, uh, no, for me, the beauty of the pipe, that version is that, of course, okay, he said, but sometimes the pipe is just a pipe, but I was, uh, I started wondering whether Magritte knew this when yeah. he painted his yeah. famous Cine Pine Pip, and I Can think you that make a synthesis? this would be... Sometimes pipe is not a cigar, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, precisely, the better synthesis is, I think Freud should have answered like this to the question when students ask, but what about, what is the meaning your, of your even present pipe, and he should... Like, you mean this, but this is not a pipe. You know, this would be this Monty Python answer to this. So, but just, uh, if sometimes a pipe is just a pipe, the point of the Verneinung art article is precisely that no is never just no. 
and that the more instrumental its use, that is, the more it functions as a pure signifier, the more the chance there is that something else gets stuck on into it. So the famous example, you ask who this person in the dream can be, it is not my mother, die Mutter ist es nicht. In which case, at Freud, the question is settled. We can indeed be sure that it is her. But what becomes more and more obvious uh, as we follow Freud's arguments further is that what is introduced by this negation is precisely something else besides the alternative, it is mother, isn't, it isn't mother. So if we take this a little bit step by step, without being asked who played part in his dream, the patient rushes forward and volunteers the word mother accompanied by negation. It is as if he has to say it, but at the same time cannot. It is imperative and impossible at the same time. The result is that the word is uttered as denied. And as Freud puts it, the repression coexists with the thing being consciously spoken out. And I think the first mistake to avoid here is to read this in terms of what this person really saw in his dream and then because of a conscious censorship light about it in his account to the analyst. For, and this is crucial not only for the understanding of Verneinung but also of the Freudian unconscious as such, what is unconscious here in, the, in this case is first and foremost the censorship, precisely, and not simply its object, mother. The latter is fully present in the statement and introduced by the subject himself, who could have also not mentioned her at all. So the unconscious sticks here to this in-between or to this distortion, this not, and is not hidden in what subject supposedly really saw in his dream. It could well be that in the dream actually appeared another unknown or known person, yet the story of the unconscious that is relevant for analysis begins with this not my mother that takes place in the account of the dream. So the unconscious is always to be looked for in the actuality of its articulations and doesn't ex exist in some place independently of them. But then things become even more interesting for Freud goes on to say that even though in analysis we can bring this person to withdraw the knot, to accept the content of the repressed, to accept that it was, after all, the mother, but he says the repressive process itself is not yet removed by this. So the knot itself is negated, so to say it is not, not mother, yet something of it persists the repression, the symptoms persist beyond becoming conscious of the repressed. So one way of formulating this, of course, is precisely that we can accept the repressed content, eliminate it, but we cannot eliminate this structure of the gap that generates it. But we could also say, perhaps another take on it, that the patient actually wanted to say precisely what he said, namely that neither that it was some other person than the mother, nor that it was mother, but that it was the not mother or the mother not. And I think we should take this precisely as the object of the further inquiry. And I will tell you two jokes, I like jokes as you know probably, uh, that will help us, I think, get a better grip of the singular object mother not that we are talking about here. So the first joke is from a movie, from the Lubitsch's movie, Ninochka, and it's told as a joke in the movie, so it appears as a joke there. And it goes like this, a guy goes into a restaurant and asks, uh, to, and says to the waiter, coffee without cream, please. The waiter replies, I'm sorry, sir, but we are out of cream. Could it be without milk? So this is the, the Lubitsch, and since we are here in the ex-Eastern uh, Berlin, I will tell you another similar DDR joke. I will tell it in German, so excuse my pronunciation. Eine Kundin fragt im Kaufhaus, haben Sie hier keine Socken? Oh nein, antwortet die Verkäuferin, hier haben wir keine Pullovern. Keine Socken gibt es eine Etage höher. <laughs> <laughs> the same, the same. 
Carmen. So a negation of something, and I owe this to, to Robert Fowler, who is, of course, full of this kind of examples also. A negation of something is not pure absence or pure nothing, or simply the complementary of what it negates. The moment it is spoken, there remains a trace of, what, of that which is not. This is a dimension introduced and made possible, yes, by the signifier, yet irreducible to it. <coughs> it has or can have a positive albeit spectral quality. It is not yet something, yet no longer nothing. And this spectral something, which can be formulated in the precise terms of with, without, cream or whatever, is irreducible to both alternatives, cream, no cream. So to return to Freudian example, when mother thus appears in this singular alive composition with negation as not mother or mother not, it looks as if both terms irredeemably contaminate each other, as if the not marked the mother with the stamp of the unconscious desire like made in Germany, stamped on the object as Freud puts it, and mother no less contaminated the formal purity of the negation with, as we can sometimes read on the packing of certain kinds of food, certain elements in traces. But perhaps we should be more precise, and I think this is not yet the right way to put it. <coughs> we should be more precise and say that the mother we start with, just before the negation hits her, so to say, is not the same as the object mother produced through this negation, via the work of the unconscious, precisely. It is another mother, a mother, why not to put it this way, with consequences. Not mother as an element of nature, and of course I refer to what I was saying yesterday. If this exists, a mother as element of nature at all, so which is, of course, not necessarily true. So, which is precisely because it is something else that is produced here, which is precisely, I think, why admitting that it has been indeed mother, after all, doesn't help a lot. And why, in spite of this admission, the essence of Verdringung persists. For what we get in this way is somehow of no real use to us. You could say it contains only an information or certain knowledge and cuts us from the work of the unconscious, which is the very thing that matters, or we could say, which is the point of truth, precisely, of this knowledge. And it is already here, I think, in Freud, that we can detect a kind of a, a first indication of what Lacan then takes up, uh, this kind of connection between work and truth, that there is something uh, uh, in a certain way that makes them uh, function together or in a similar way, or even become uh, not really identical, but had the, the same structure. So for the product of this work, of the unconscious, is the new object mother. We could even say mother as surplus value, a surplus mother, so to say. And uh, I think it, it, one can draw really a stunning yet uh, illuminating parallel between this structure and this mistake when we think that we will say, okay, it was mother and then everything will be settled. This mistake, uh, it's a standing parallel between this and a kind of skeptical criticism that Lacan expresses vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis kind of a simplistic uh, leftist um, idea according to which the proletariat will demand back what, from, what was stolen from it. And he says for what it gets back, it's never what has been really stolen from it. It's always something else. It doesn't solve the problem. We can say that thing that was stolen was transformed in the very process of being stolen. It is never, I can never get it back in the same way. But this is just, I will pursue this line which stunningly leads to the core of political economy uh, uh, in a moment. But now I would like to look first at the, let's say, okay, ontological implications of the structure that I tried to isolate through all these examples and jokes, namely this with without, and I will go first back to Freud and to another aspect of his article. 